Have you ever thought about who the worst Sith are? And no, Kylo Ren doesn't count. I think the worst Sith in all of Star Wars is Asajj Ventress. She's a cool Sith assassin and everything, but she ends up working for the light side eventually. You just can't do that as a Sith. In the same vein, the next Sith on my list is Darth Vader. Before you rush to the comments to flame me, hear me out. First of all, Vader was essentially a pawn for his entire life. He couldn't grow in power because of his suit, so he never had a chance of overthrowing his master. He was stuck doing Sidious' bidding. Secondly, I want to bring up the Sith Code here. The final line of the code says, Through victory, my chains are broken. Vader was pretty much the embodiment of someone wrapped up in their chains. He was fueled by regrets from his past life as Anakin, knowing he could never achieve the victory he wanted. And as we find out, the only way Vader could break free of those chains was to turn back to the light side. Vader was one of the only Sith who was completely redeemed and turned back to the light. A true Sith stays dedicated to the dark side of the Force. So I guess now is a good time for me to explain how I'm ranking these Sith. This isn't entirely a weakest to strongest list, although I am trying to take that into account. This is about the best and the worst Sith. The best Sith are those that live out what it means to be a Sith to the fullest extent. That means that they are truly tapped into the dark side. They are driven by self selfishness, and ambition for power above all else. I'll focus on three main things, their power, their accomplishments, and how well they embody the Sith Code in the things I just outlined. Think about the exact opposite of what makes a good Jedi. No good morals. Completely evil. And don't worry, Vader isn't actually at the bottom of the list. We'll get to him later. Another Sith that turned to the light side was Darth Gravid. Luckily, instead of toppling an entire Sith Empire like Vader, Gravid only managed to destroy a bunch of Sith artifacts and documents before his apprentice killed him. Similar to Ventress, Savage Opress makes this list because of his training from Dooku as well as Maul. Some of you may argue that Savage and Ventress don't count because of the Rule of Two, but the Rule of Two is just a law, which means it can be broken. It doesn't prevent other people from being Sith outside of the two Bainites. Savage follows the Sith Code as far as I can tell, and he was apprenticed to other Sith, so he counts. However, people like Kylo Ren, Snoke, or the Inquisitors don't count as Sith. They didn't receive much formal training from a Sith Master, and they don't follow Sith rituals or practices. They are simply agents for more powerful Sith. The same goes for Acolytes. The reason I put Savage here is because he was basically a pawn for his entire life, just a brute doing the bidding of his masters. Sure, Savage was super powerful in terms of strength, but otherwise he didn't have much going for him. Darth Bandon also didn't have much going for him. I always think of Darth Brandon when I say that. It's funny because both guys are equally retarded. Bandon is Darth Malak's apprentice from Knights of the Old Republic. So in case you were wondering, yes, this video does include every Sith from Legends too, so make sure to stick around to the end to see where your favorite Sith is ranked. In Darth Bandon's first scene, he kills an innocent Sith trooper for no reason. That's just dumb. But then he faces Jedi Revan in a duel. Bandon tells Revan to beg for his life because he stands no chance against him. Of course, Jedi Revan completely destroyed him. That's kind of like Darth in Rage, who exists only to be killed by Darth Knox at some point. Who on earth did they hire to come up with these names? I'll do them one better. How about Darth drop a like on the video? Anyway, next up is is a really interesting Sith named Darth Vectivus. Vectivus didn't really care about power or killing Jedi. Instead, he just focused on Sith lore, rituals, and meditation. He had his own personal moral code that he followed, as he ruled and managed a mining facility. He died of natural causes surrounded by his family and friends. That makes him a major exception compared to most Sith. A nice story, but not very good for a Sith, I'm afraid. Who doesn't want... That's why Darth Venomous fought Darth Plagueis in a duel, to see who would be Tenebris' apprentice. Venomous lost and he was kept alive so that Plagueis could experiment on him. In a similar way, Lord Calitho had the gift of foresight, but it only got clear when he was closer to death. So his Sith comrades had the bright idea to imprison him and constantly starve and torture him so he was always close to death. That way, the other Sith could know what was coming. I bet they never would have saw this one coming though, a Sith called Darth Millennial. Again, the names. This guy rejected the Sith under the rule of two to make his own dark side religion, where he called himself the Supreme Prophet. Instead, it was more like a cult and they only existed to kill anyone who didn't believe in their teachings. Thankfully, Palpatine, being the benevolent emperor he is, decided to send his inquisitors to wipe out the religion thousands of years later. And next up, we have Darth Gen Z, who was addicted to video games and TikTok. Just kidding, instead, we get this less entertaining group of Sith from another cult called the Lost Tribe of the Sith. The two Sith that I'm ranking here are called Darish Vol and Sarasu Talon. They're just not powerful and their cult sucks. Right above the Lost Tribe, I'm gonna put a bunch of other Sith from the rule of one Sith sect. There's not much known about them, and most are just blindly loyal robots serving Darth Krait, which isn't a very good trait to have if you're a Sith. A particularly bad Sith from the rule of one era is Darth Ruin. He lets his apprentice kill him because he thinks it'll help her be more powerful. That apprentice is the next Sith on our list, Darth Talon. I know a lot of you have heard about her. Probably for nothing she did as a Sith, 
Sith, if you get what I mean. Unfortunately, good looks don't make you a good Sith. She's super loyal to Darth Crate and seemingly has no personal ambitions or thoughts of her own. She even fails repeatedly in her first missions for Crate, so I guess there's only one reason he kept her around. The only Sith I can find from this era that actually tried to overthrow Crate was Darth Werlock III. Weirlock essentially kills Crate after he was injured in battle. Weirlock takes over the Sith Empire only for Crate to be resurrected. See, this is why I hate the Legacy Era. Anyway, getting back to the good old days, we have Darth Shaw. We don't know anything about her except that she found Darth Maumon and trained him only for Maumon to kill her, which gives me the perfect transition to talk about Darth Maumon himself. This guy is weird. He's sadistic, probably mentally ill, and just generally deranged, and that's putting it lightly. He was a self-proclaimed artist. As a small child, he killed his family's cat and made a sculpture out of its bones, flesh, and organs. Naturally, like all good parents do, they sent him to a mental asylum. That's where Shaw freed him once she found out he was force sensitive. If only she knew. Later on in life, for his next art piece, he made a super weapon which would destroy a city, but he wanted to freeze time with the force so that the citizens of that city would permanently experience the climax right before death, eternally enduring the worst possible emotions. For once, the Jedi saw what was happening and took action. They stopped Momin and killed him before he could launch the weapon. His spirit inhabited a new body that met Vader, and Momin personally designed Vader's fortress on Mustafar. Finally, Vader put an end to him for good after Momin basically made fun of Vader for losing Padme. So after all of that, Momin is the only person I've ever heard of who has the title of Dark Side Sculptor. If Disney needs help making a compelling new villain, they should just make another one of those guys. The Stranger? Nah, more like the Sculptor. Next up, we've got a series of Sith that we just don't know much about. First is Darth Anedu. He's the first Sith known to take the name of Darth. He was extremely powerful in Sith sorcery and things like that, but for some reason, he just became super paranoid and scared of other Sith thinking they were out to get him. It got so bad that he actually went into hiding and eventually entombed himself, where he died. Next is Darth Scotia. He's a cybernetically enhanced Sith who was supposed to be pretty powerful, but he was extremely arrogant and overconfident in his enhancement. A Sith acolyte managed to disable his enhancements and wiped the floor with him. Darth Sanguis went to Exegol to achieve immortality, but was turned into an animal while performing a ritual. Luckily, another Sith called Dark Noctis came along. Supposedly, she had the power to take the galaxy, but she wanted to save that for later and become immortal first. Seems smart, right? I guess she wasn't very smart after all, because Sanguis tricks her into becoming an animal too. Sanguis died, but he was freed from the curse. Noctis also had a curved lightsaber blade, but I can't help that she's just fighting with a candy cane. Remember Darth Gravid, who was at the bottom of the list? His apprentice, Darth Jean, is the one who killed him. As Gravid's apprentice, she could have easily gone along with his plan for destroying the Sith's progress in the Rule of Two, but she showed her dedication to the dark side by taking him out and preserving Darth Bane's legacy. Other than that, we don't know anything else about her. Just like Darth Tannis, she's credited with building this pyramid and a super weapon that's seen in Rebels. Darth Vindican is the master of Darth Malgus. He gets destroyed by a Jedi in the duel, but Malgus comes in and saves the day. Malgus, being the good Sith he is, takes this opportunity to kill his master. Darth Ikarol is the one who initially discovered Malgus, though. He got recognition from Emperor Vishit himself for being an outstanding Sith, whatever that's worth. The fact that Vishit bothered to notice Ikarol is actually pretty impressive, because for most of his reign, he had a lesser group of Sith called the Dark Council, who did a lot of the busy work of ruling the Empire for him. I think the worst of all of these Dark Council members is Darth Thanaton. He basically gets destroyed on so many occasions by Darth Nox that another Dark Council member, Darth Mortis, broke his neck. Thanaton was obsessed with the rules and an extremely overbearing loyalist to Vitiate. And this highlights the problem that I have with the Dark Council. As Sith, they shouldn't have been content with just lording over their little spheres of the Empire. I mean, what good Sith is fine with just existing as head of logistics and production for hundreds of years? If you know the office, this feels like Dwight being the assistant to the assistant of the regional manager, you know what I mean? Obviously, these Sith were powerful in their own right, but like I said, this list is not about who's the strongest. And for the vast majority of these Sith, we know nothing about them except a name drop every once in a while. In total, across the thousands of years of Vitiate's reign, I found about 35 Dark Council members in total. In no particular order, here's 30 of them. There's a few other Dark Council members I'll mention later on, but Darth Locust stands out as one of the few Council members who showed enough drive and ambition to attempt to overthrow Vitiate. Locust gathered the other 11 Dark Council members and went to Vitiate's citadel. They arrived on Vitiate's front doorstep only to be vaporized by a bright light, which we can only assume is Vitiate's pure power. Vitiate left Locust alive though and made sure to torture her to death for good measure. Next, we have two Sith that are featured in training simulations for Starkiller in the Force Unleashed game, Darth Phobos and Darth Desolus. Darth Desolus was a Jedi turned Sith from Utapal. He hated the Jedi so much that he recruited and trained his own army to fight them. Desolus and his army managed to take out 2,000 Jedi before they were baited and completely wiped out in a finesse move from the Jedi, which makes Desolus way cooler than Phobos. Phobos went on a rampage, killing a ton of Sith in an attempt to take over. Eventually, she was forced into hiding, where guess what? She decided it'd be a good idea to start a cult of her own. What makes her cult better than any 
one thing I've ever mentioned before is that they became so dangerous that the Jedi and the Sith teamed up to take her out. So she must have been doing a pretty good job. Okay, and now that we're through with all of those random Sith, I can finally talk more about Vader. I have to give credit where credit is due. Vader is a terrible person. He killed the younglings, destroyed the Jedi Temple, and hunted down some of the last remaining Jedi. That's a great set of accomplishments for any Sith. But, like I said earlier, he was stuck essentially being Sidious's errand boy. And in the end, he did turn to the light side. So there's no way I can put Vader any higher than right here on this list. Now, back to the Legacy era, we've got the Dark Lady Lumaya. For some of you, this ranking may seem a bit low. After all, Lumaya was important for trying to keep the Sith alive after the fall of the Galactic Empire. However, it's very unclear how powerful she is, given that the power scaling with this era is completely absurd. Sure, she faces Luke, who is the strongest Jedi of all time in Legends, but I'm inclined to think that that doesn't matter all that much. Other than turning Jason Solo to the dark side, she doesn't really accomplish much either, at least in my opinion, so that's why she's here. Next is Ludo Kresh, who competed with Naga Sadal for control of the Sith Empire. Ludo Kresh wasn't interested in war and potential expansion for the Empire. Naga Sadal was the complete opposite. Eventually things reached a boiling point and Ludo Kresh lost to Naga Sadal in a 1v1 for control of the Empire. In this instance, I would say that Ludo Kresh isn't really acting as a Sith should by not seeking out Luthor. However, based on the results of the Great Hyperspace War, it looks like he was right. I'm not knowledgeable enough to know if Ludo Kresh was just making the correct tactical decision, or if he just wasn't as evil or power hungry as Naga Sadal. If you think you know the answer, let me know in the comments. But because of their 1v1, by default, I've got to put Naga Sadal higher, despite all the damage he did in the Sith Empire. Luckily, Naga Sadal didn't rule for long after his failure, because his apprentice Frida Nad killed him and became the most powerful Sith in the galaxy at that time. He ruled the planet of Onderon, which is Saul Guerrero's planet by the way. Eventually, some Jedi came along and killed Frida Nad. Another man that had a significant part in bringing about the new Sith is none other than Lord Tyrannus. I'm really not sure where to put Dooku. As objective as I'd like to be, I have to admit that some of these rankings higher up on the list are going to be more subjective. If you disagree with me, feel free to tell me why. But Dooku is definitely one of the most iconic Sith of all time. His curved lightsaber hilt, generational dueling skills, you name it. But at least from my perspective, Tyrannus is kind of an underachiever as a Sith. By the end of his life, we can see that he was really just a pawn in Sidious's game. The moment Sidious had no further use for him, Dooku was taken out. And thus, Dooku didn't really accomplish much on his own. He was just a puppet, not all that dissimilar to Snoke if you really think about it. I don't know, maybe that's just me, but that's why I can't rank Dooku any higher than right here. For example, Marco Ragnos ruled the Sith Empire at the very end of its golden age. This was the last period of Sith power and expansion right before Naga Sadal ruined everything. He was known as the most powerful Dark Lord of his era, and he was the one who'd originally discovered Vitiate and gave him power, which is obviously extremely important for the Sith Empire down the road. Darth Cognus could quite literally see down the road, as she possessed special precognitive abilities, being able to see clear pictures and visions of future events. She was trained by the legendary Darth Bane himself, as well as Darth Xana, so many of their secrets and abilities were passed down to Cognis. She also caught a major W when she decided to banish Darth Millennial from the Sith because of his heretical beliefs. So we were spared from Darth Gen Z because of Cognis, probably. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Next is a real wild card. Some wouldn't consider him a Sith, but I can't make a video ranking Sith without Starkiller. Sure, he never got the formal title of Darth, and he broke the Rule of Two, but as I said before, I believe he can still have Sith outside of the Rule of Two, and he was considered the Dark Lord Vader's apprentice, so he did receive training from a Sith. To be fair, for the majority of his life, he was just Vader's tool and Starkiller lacks any true motivations that a good Sith needs. Anyway, because Starkiller is such an anomaly, consider this ranking an honorable mention more than anything. You'll have to tell me your thoughts on him in the comments. But speaking of anomalies, I can't go without mentioning Darth Sion. Sion's body was cut apart in battle, but rather than die like a normal person, Sion channeled as much anger as he could to will himself to live. His sheer hatred and power in the dark side forced his body to stay together, keeping him alive. Unfortunately, for most of his life, Sion served under other Sith in the Empire before becoming part of the Triumvirate. And as we found out at the end of his life, his method of keeping himself alive was just a state of weakness and dependency. While he could technically be immortal, he always had to live with immense pain, focusing all of his willpower on holding his body together. A unique Sith for sure, but far from being one of the best. Our next Sith has something in common with Sion, that being the use of hatred to keep himself alive. That Sith is Darth Maul. Maul is considered to be one of the best Sith of all time in terms of strength and durability. His brutal and aggressive lightsaber style made him one of the best fighters among the Sith as well. Maul was extremely ambitious, and he was constantly plotting for new ways to gain power. He would get what he wanted by any means, be that revenge, power, or control. He was truly in tune with his passions, which is exceptional for a Sith. Unfortunately, Maul was doomed to failure for most of his life. He consistently gets owned by Sidious or Obi-Wan, preventing
preventing him from achieving his goals. Ultimately, Maul will always be a story of unfulfilled potential. The same can be said for Darth Kydus, who could have easily been the most powerful Sith of all time. However, for starters, he was only a Sith for about a year's time, so he simply didn't have long to grow in the dark side. Because of that, he also didn't have much time to accomplish anything as a Sith. His main goal seemed to have been to be a sacrifice for the galaxy, to prevent his visions of a Sith ruling the galaxy from coming to fruition. This is what makes me think Kydus wasn't fully committed to the dark side. Granted, the writing in the books that cover his life are inconsistent at best, so I might be interpreting things wrong. But to me, it seems like he was deceived by the Dark Lady Lumaya more than anything. And at the end of the day, partially due to a lack of dueling skill, he died at the hands of his sister and Luke Skywalker. The story of Kydus may be one of the biggest unfulfilled potential examples ever. Unlike Kydus, Darth Xana made sure to fulfill her potential. She was Darth Bane's apprentice. Like any good Sith does, she knew she had to kill her master. Unfortunately for her, Bane had special armor that was nearly impenetrable, so she decided to visit the Jedi Temple on Coruscant and search the Jedi Archives for her answer. She was able to accomplish this mission by directly disguising her Force aura as a light side and directly manipulating the Jedi around her. Sometime later, she fought Darth Bane himself in an epic duel. While Xana had Bane on the ropes, Bane tried to transfer his spirit into Xana's body. Her power in sorcery prevented this, and she finished off Bane once and for all. While she prevented Bane from controlling her, she allowed some of Bane's essence to be imprinted onto herself, which only made her more powerful. From there, she would continue Bane's legacy by training Cognus and preserving the Sith for the future. Nearly 1,000 years later, this would allow for Darth Tenebris to come along, who is most famous for being the master of Dark Plagueis the Wise. Tenebris was a Bith Sith, or a Bith Lord, whatever you want to call it. Not only was he vitally important for being Plagueis' master, but he was also a scientist, and a Sith who was obsessed with gathering new information. Remember Darth Vin Venomous? Tenebris used them to personally conduct experiments to learn more about the Force. He also sought out connections with organizations like the Trade Federation and the Banking Clan to spread the Sith's influence. Even then, Tenebris was pulling strings behind the scenes in the Senate and on Coruscant. This would lay the groundwork for Sidious to take the reins later on. While on a mission to a mining planet, Tenebris and Plagueis were betrayed by their allies. Plagueis took this opportunity to kill his master. Interestingly enough, Plagueis chose to investigate the people who betrayed them, which led him down a rabbit hole all the way to Naboo, where he would discover a young boy named Sheev Palpatine. So in more ways than one, Darth Tenebris deserves a lot of credit as the catalyst in the resurgence of the Sith Empire under Sidious. Sidious' empire near nearly completely wiped out the Jedi. The closest the Jedi came to being wiped out before that was probably during the era of the Sith Triumvirate, which was led by Darth Treya. Formerly known as Kreia, Darth Treya had some really special force powers. She wielded three lightsabers at once through telekinesis, making her an extremely dangerous opponent. She was also able to strip her enemies of the force entirely. One of her ultimate goals was to destroy the force itself. The beginning stages of her plan involved a war with the Jedi, which resulted in the first Jedi Purge. I think her desire to destroy the force is actually a really good idea, and I'm surprised more Sith didn't think this way. She thought that the Force didn't give individuals enough control over their own lives, and as such she wanted to eliminate all Force users. In line with the Sith Code, this seems like a totally reasonable goal. The Force was the thing keeping her in chains, and she sought victory over it. Before she could really enact her plan to its full potential though, she was eliminated by the Jedi Exile, who was a wound in the Force. Think about a light side version of Nihilus, who's coming up very soon by the way. But before we get to Nihilus, we have to talk about a few more Sith first, like Darth Jadis. Not much is known about Jadis, but he was widely known as the most powerful Sith in the Empire, second only to Vitiate. Vitiate himself even declared Jadis as the best Sith the Empire had ever produced. And considering Vitiate ruled for thousands of years, this means a lot. Jadis presided over the Dark Council. As such, he had great personal power and also an immense power base, maybe even greater than that of Vitiate. Jadis was also known as a brilliant tactician. He preferred to pull the strings from behind the scenes, making calculated power moves to get what he wanted. There's not much more I can say about Jadis, but anyone that gets personally recognized by Vitiate deserves a high spot on this list. Later on in his career, Jadis disappeared outside of the galaxy, never to be seen again. There was still some evidence that he had agents doing his bidding in the galaxy, but no one knows for sure. Ironically, that part of Jadis' story is very similar to another Sith who was on the Dark Council named Darth Nox. Nox killed the incumbent council member Darth Thanaton to get her seat on the council. She was known to be powerful in pretty much every Sith power, and she has the unique ability to absorb other Sith spirits, killing their essence but gaining their power. This easily makes her one of the most powerful Sith ever, and to my knowledge, most power scaling would support this. Essentially, she also shared control of the Sith Empire with Darth Maul, who is the next Sith on my list. During Vitiate's absence, Maul was the de facto leader of the Empire through his leadership role on the Dark Council. He presided over the sphere of defense and had a lifetime of military experience from war with the Republic. Despite all of that experience, Maul couldn't handle Revan's attempts to resurrect the Emperor, which caused 
calls Mars death and Nox's disappearance. Speaking of Revan, our next Sith is Darth Malak, who is Revan's second in command. Revan and Malak were formerly Jedi who fell to the dark side together. They formed their own splinter Sith Empire of sorts, and even took the Star Forge, which gave them considerable power. Malak tried to overthrow Revan on multiple occasions, one of which was a duel, where Revan chopped off Malak's jaw. This is why Malak wears his iconic metal prosthetic jaw. The second time around, Malak was actually successful, defeating Revan's flagship with his own. From that point on, Malak controlled the Sith Empire and the Star Forge for himself. While Malak was extremely powerful in his own right, Revan ended up owning him again, this time as a Jedi. Logically then, Revan is going to be next on my list above Malak, at the 11th spot on this list. Revan was an excellent military leader and strategist, probably the best ever among the Sith. He was obsessed with gaining knowledge, not all that dissimilar to Tenebris like I mentioned earlier. The key difference between the two is that Revan was also an exceptional fighter and duelist. Remember how I said Malak attacked Revan's flagship? Well that only worked because Revan was in the process of fighting six Jedi at once who were trying to capture him, and these Jedi weren't pushovers either. They could be considered some of the best in the Order at that time. I know there's a lot of bloodthirsty Revan fans out there that are going to think the 11th spot is way too low for him, but trust me, there are actually 10 more Sith that are just better than him, in power and in dedication. So to kick off the top 10, I've got Darth Plagueis. Plagueis is easily one of the most powerful Sith of all time, on account of the knowledge he learned for himself and gleaned from Tenebris. Plagueis had the special power and initiative to cloud the Jedi's foresight and flood the galaxy with dark side aura, which paved the way for the confused and complacent Jedi Sidious would face later on. Speaking of which, I have to give credit where credit is due. Plagueis essentially trained the best Sith of all time in Sidious. It is definitely worth noting, since any student is only as good as their master, and Plagueis was definitely strong in his own right. If you buy into the idea that the Sith got stronger with each new iteration within the Rule of Two, Plagueis was one of the most powerful Sith of all time. And while he was a talented fighter as well, I think he'd probably lose in a 1v1 with our next Sith, Darth Malgus. To say Malgus is an impressive fighter would be an understatement. He was absurdly powerful with brute force, enhanced by his strength in the force. This coupled with his legendary dueling skills made him nearly impossible to defeat. He and his master, Vindican, took back the Sith world of Korriban, which was very important for the Sith and their heritage. And like any good Sith does, Malgus eventually betrayed and successfully killed his master. Now, as leader of the Sith Empire, Malgus had his crowning achievement, the sacking of Coruscant. He personally took the Jedi Temple while his forces took the Galactic Senate, forcing the Republic to sign treaties that were extremely beneficial to the Sith Empire. Successfully striking at the heart of the Republic is something very few Sith have ever accomplished, and that fact alone grants Malgus a lot of clout and influence among the Sith and on my list. One of the other rare times the Sith successfully attacked Coruscant was under Exar Kun's rule, and he's the 8th best Sith of all. In terms of raw power, Exar Kun rivals even that of Sidious. He's also one of the first known Sith to ever use a double-bladed lightsaber, a technique which he mastered and made him arguably the best Sith duelist of all time. Kun was an avid learner of forbidden force abilities. For example, he had the ability to twist Jedi's minds with magic, turning them on their masters and comrades. The biggest proof of his power is in his spirit. Typically, spirits are much weaker than their living counterparts. Even so, in spirit, Exar Kun gave Grandmaster Luke Skywalker a lot of trouble. It took Luke plus a dozen Jedi to finish him off. It was also noted that Exar Kun's spirit was a threat to the entire galaxy. If we're talking about threats to the entire galaxy, then we have to talk about Darth Nihilus. When you earn the title of Devourer of Worlds for yourself, you know you've made it. To be honest with you guys, I had a really hard time choosing where to put Nihilus. This is because of the state of his existence as a wound in the Force. You see, in order to survive, Nihilus was forced to consume and devour entire planets and populaces to feed his need for Force energy. The thing is though, this craving was insatiable and it only grew with time, which left Nihilus chained to his affliction. At one point, he even lost his physical body from the affliction, which essentially left him as a primitive spirit with no direction. So on one hand, I think Nihilus didn't have much in the way of free will, with no way to break his chains, as the code says. But he's such an absurd enigma that I think he deserves to be up here. His ability to use Force Drain on his opponent at such a massive scale is something that no one has ever replicated. So what do you think? Does Nihilus' insatiable desires represent the best things about a Sith, such as giving in to passion? Or does his limitations earn him a lower spot on his list? Let me know in the comments. While Nihilus was all about destruction, Darth Bane was all about preservation. Without him, the Sith might have ceased to exist. During the start of the Jedi's Golden Age, the Sith were in trouble. The solution? Go into hiding. After all, the sheer proliferation of Sith had led to a lot of infighting and some Sith were just weak. These factors and more were leading to their downfall time and time again. By limiting the amount of Sith to two, the Sith could grow in power with every new generation until they would be unstoppable. Darth Bane accomplished this by systematically eliminating the Sith factions he considered a nuisance, a powerful act in and of itself. 
Some people consider this a flaw of Bane's, to restrict the amount of Sith in existence, but we can clearly see from his result that he had the right idea. Because of that, I think Bane has the best case to be the prophesied Sithari, the Sith who would rise up and achieve the Sith's goals. Whatever you think of Bane, you have to admit that he was an extremely influential person and a truly dedicated Sith. He didn't lack a desire for power, but he had the patience and foresight to wait until the right time. But more importantly, we're moving on into the top five, and I think you're going to have a hard time arguing with any of these picks. To start us off, in fifth place is Darth Krayt. He's the leader of the Rule of One sect that came about after the death of Sidious. You could argue that he's the most powerful Sith of all time, when comparing Krayt to Grandmaster Luke Skywalker, who is easily the best Jedi of all time in Legends. Over the course of Krayt's 200 years in the galaxy, he did a lot. He was personally trained by the spirit of one of the first Sith Lords ever, which makes Krayt a second generation Sith if you really think about it. As such, he possessed some of the most unique Force abilities ever. He had also received never seen before bio enhancements from the Yuuzhan Vong, a species from outside the galaxy that had access to many powers some would consider unnatural. As far as accomplishments go, well, he single-handedly resurrected the Sith Order in his image. Krayt took Coruscant, which like I said, is a big deal in the cycle of events in Star Wars. Unlike his predecessors, he actually decided to do the biggest middle finger to the Jedi and restart the Sith Temple there, right on the Jedi's home turret. With all that in mind, you might be wondering how on earth there's four Sith that are better than Krayt. Just trust me here. Let me tell you about Tulak Horde, one of the most legendary ancient Sith. In relation to Tulak Horde, Darth Treya says this, If you were to face an ancient Sith Lord in combat, you would learn that we are as children playing with toys compared to the prowess of the old masters. And you've got to remember, Treya was a part of the Sith Triumvirate, and she was a force in her own right. But even she had to admit that the Sith of her era, such as Sion and Nihilus, hailed in comparison to the ancients of the old Sith Empire. Tulak Horde might have had the strongest telekinetic powers ever. He could easily pull enormous ships out of their path. Once, he even caused a ship the size of a rebel corvette to come out of orbit and crash to the surface. It was told that he was completely undefeated in lightsaber combat too. Supposedly, he single-handedly killed a thousand Jedi in one battle. While Exar Kun was a problem for his time, Horde is probably the undisputed goat at lightsaber skills. If you thought those feats were great, think again. Emperor Vitiate has something to say. Either directly or indirectly behind the scenes, Vitiate ruled the galaxy with an iron fist for 1500 years. To my knowledge, he's the only other Sith besides Nihilus who could devour entire worlds, which Vitiate did on a select occasion. Despite all of the legendary Sith that lived throughout his reign, Vitiate remained dominant, his rule never questioned or disputed. Some even consider him to be the most perfect, literal embodiment of the dark side, earning him the title the Immortal God. Except, sorry Vitiate, but Sidious actually does that better. Vitiate can barely duel with a lightsaber. After all, he didn't really need to. However, Sidious enjoyed galactic dominance just like Vitiate, but Sidious was an amazing duelist, mastering nearly all of the lightsaber forms. Sidious finally accomplished Bane's vision for the Rule of Two. The Sith Empire was reborn under him, and the Jedi were almost completely destroyed after thousands of years. During Sidious's existence, he also dominated the Force and any other known Force users, namely Vader. In my mind, this is exactly what a Sith should do. And we have to remember that George Lucas and numerous comic books and other EU material reference Sidious as the best and most powerful Sith ever. I'd be an idiot if I didn't take that into consideration. But you probably noticed that Sidious is only number two on the list. There's actually an ancient Sith that most people forget about, who is easily more powerful than Sidious, Vitiate, you fill in the blank, whoever, they're better. Huh? Throughout the Star Wars timeline, he was pulling the strings. He takes many forms, but he's best known as Darth Jar Jar. Guess what? Misa going to hurt you, son. If you don't like it, subscribe.